All right, right on time. We're going to go ahead and get started. I think that's kind of hot. Um, and kind of go through this session here for you guys within the next 40 minutes, actually, or less now. Uh, but basically, welcome. Uh, this session is based around the concept, the tap it out or tap out. Uh, if you consider uh, the play on words, their app. Uh, basically, in the next 30 minutes or so, you're going to see three of us, and we'll kind of give a quick intro who we are, mm -hmm. go through a round robin cycle of trying to one up each other essentially or just pounding you guys with all these features of native applications. Uh, tips and tricks you may not know about in Office 2013 and or natively in Windows 8 as well as things that you can go get for free. Okay, everything we're showing you here today to my knowledge and again we were just polishing some of this list doesn't cost you a dime unless you have uh, unless you need to go get Office 2013. Oh by the way it's free for all teachers in the world through 365 now by the way. All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, kind of a, a quick introduction to the three trainers in the room. My name is Josh Sawyer. Our Twitter handle's up there. It's kind of hard to see Brad's there on the right. Uh, but we will put this back up at the end as well as we're going to host all this content for you guys. Uh, feel free to stay a little bit after and talk with us. Uh, kind of quick rundown is all three of us are from Hillsborough County right here in Tampa. Uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools, we are the eighth largest district in the nation. I think that's the number eighth largest now. Um, and in addition to us working in Hillsborough County, we have a pretty unique relationship with Microsoft where we're actually known as Microsoft Innovative Educators, either master trainers, trainers, or what they call a new thing from last year, expert educators. All three of us are experts. All three of us are trainers. All right, so we kind of have our split brain in addition to our district or our daily jobs. And basically, if you just kind of want to do some translation there, if you think of Google Educator, Apple Educator, this is Microsoft's flavor of it. Um, and we are in kind of a master trainer capacity. So if you go to the Microsoft room, we're also training there. This session is us training on behalf of our district in partnership uh, with Microsoft. Um, so I'm Josh, this is Maria, and this is Brad. And for the sake of time, we're not going to go through a whole extended long personal, uh, <laughs> personal uh, invitation slash introduction. But our jobs in our district is actually now in IT. We all came out of professional development and technology training. And what we do now is actually a pretty darn cool job. And we get to bring the latest and the greatest in current trends into our district and try to make them work and steer and align the business to them. So when you guys hear of new stuff happening, our team's looking at it before it ever hits the district, hopefully. The word is hopefully. Uh, but we do know that folks come to these crazy conferences and come back with bright, shiny objects, and they plug them in. And so that's when the work really begins. Hopefully what we share with you today is going to not only A, inspire you, but challenge you to take some risks either in your classroom or in your position, whatever it is that you do. All right? We are not afraid to fail, so if something goes wrong, that's kind of the nature of the game here with technology. What we're going to do is when it happens, we're actually running multiple devices here. <clears throat> so if mine fails, I say switch it and it goes to the other trainer. All right? The whole job here and kind of the concept behind this was we were actually going to do a tap out to where one trader couldn't keep up with the other and then eventually one trader would kind of win the bout. Um, since, we've kind of modified some of this to get the most out there to you. So if you kind of want to follow along with the Microsoft hashtag here, pound MIE chat, uh, as well as the at Microsoft underscore EDU handle, that's where this whole conversation is happening globally with Microsoft in education. And then in addition to that, um, if you wanted to get on our back channel for FETC on today's meet, there it is for you. And that's been going on for three days now because we've been doing pre-conference workshops since Tuesday. And that, again, is todaysmeet.com forward slash FETC dash 2015. All right. So good point. Brad and Maria have handouts and also books. You can also grab these handouts and books in the Microsoft booth. All right. And again, these are for apps and the Microsoft Educator Network. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So go ahead and switch. It. All right. We get to share with you some of the coolest, latest, and greatest things. And this is some, just some basic Windows 8, some Windows 7 tricks very quickly. Um, I want to share with you the snipping tool. It's in Windows 7 and Windows 8. But I'm sneaking in another one my cohorts don't know about. If you're on a Windows 8 machine, one of my favorite things, because people are always, I don't know where it's at. If you're on the start tile screen, you can just start typing what you're looking for. I was asking Josh before, what was the key command? I don't have to know what the key command is. If I just start typing snipping, the search window automatically pops open where I'm at. All I have to do is then select the tool. 
and I'm here at the snipping tool. Now the snipping tool is a wonderful built-in feature that's going to let me do a screencast, a, uh, excuse me, a screen grab, screenshot of whatever I'm in. So I'm going to choose new and you can see my screen kind of blanks out. I'm going to choose the screen and then I can even do some annotation, some highlighting over it, whatever I need to do. And when I'm finished, I can either just copy and paste it into the application or I can save it to use in another application or save it and maybe I'm doing a lot of these at one time. So I have a lot of opportunities using that snipping tool to grab and to put into other things. I don't have to buy another program. I just use it and it's free and it's built into Windows 7 and Windows 8. But the other one I threw in there was the search feature when you're on the Windows 8 desktop. Brad, you're up. All right, cool. What am I doing? What's going on? So what if you're looking at uh, more than one thing at a time and you want to be able to see more than one thing at a time? So in Windows 7 and in Windows 8, there's a way to make that possible. Uh, so I'll first demonstrate what you might do in a Windows 7 machine so that you can use that tool. So I've got uh, OneNote open right here. I need something else open at the same time. So I'll go ahead and just open the internet up so I have two things. So all I have to do is grab the window and drag it all the way to the left, at which point it will pop half screen on the left. I'll take my other notebook and drag it all the way to the right, at which point it will pop half screen at the right. So very quickly I can establish a split screen view with a Windows 7 and or 8 machine uh, using uh, just a drag and snap to one side or the other. Uh, if I want to do that with an app as an example, uh, on the Windows 8 side, I'll open up the Internet Explorer app and I'll, I'll return home and open up, uh, I don't know, what other app would I open up? Um, something simple. How about the travel app? I'll open those two up. Uh, and that'll be fine. So all I have to do is drag in from the left and pause for just a moment and the Windows 8 side of the device immediately knows that I want to split screen and I'll just let go and now I have a split screen view with two apps up on the device. And if I want to I can change the size and or, well I went a little bit too far, I can change the size of one side or the other typically uh, and one will auto scale down. So that's an example of using split screen on both the Windows 7 and Windows 8 side of the device. All right, so I've been tasked with uh, two things, and we're going to kind of switch gears into office applications. We're primarily working out of 2013 here. Uh, Maria showed a really great tip or a trick for Windows 8 is the search functionality. And again, this is powered by Bing, and essentially anything I want to look for on my device, I basically just start typing. So I type the, the word Word because I want to open up Word. And there it is, I just click on it, and you'll see that it opens the native or desktop application for Word 2013. And what we're going to do is get into a blank document here, uh, and I'm going to show you two really cool features of Word that you may not know about. Uh, this first feature I'm going to show you actually works in Word Online, so if you attended any of our sessions for Office Online, or if you have OneDrive, it works in the, uh, the web app version as well. Um, how many guys ever work in a document, or you just need to get some content on a page for students to work with, or how many guys work with actually teaching business applications? Anybody in the room? Where here's how you do something in Word, long documents, here's how you do something in Excel. Uh, sometimes you need to be able to get some text in there or just throw something or dump content. And there's a really cool feature, if you didn't know about this, where you can actually insert random text, and what I'm doing is I'm typing the following parameters, equals, R-A-N-D, equals, R-A-N-D for random, and then I'm going to put open parenthesis, and then I'm going to put a number, a comma, if I can find the comma, and another number. And basically what those are is, is the amount of lines inside of the amount of paragraphs. And simply the next thing I do is hit enter and check out what happens. I didn't type all that. Okay, so equals R-A-N-D inside of the parentheses, two numbers, basically that's uh, the number of paragraphs and the number of sentences embedded within. All right, it's a pretty neat feature. The other thing is, is how many guys work with PDFs? Okay, so I'm going to open up a PDF on my Windows 8 machine here, and you can see it opens up in an app. Brad did a pretty cool trick here where we do this thing called split screen, and I'm going to split it out to where you can see this PDF on the left, but on the right-hand side, I might just so happen to have, let me get this going, Word open. Okay, so can I modify that PDF right now? I might be able to use some Adobe tools, right? 
With Office 2013, you can actually open a PDF in Word and modify the content. So those of you that think you're safe and sacred with your PDFs and your students can't change what you're doing or you've got that golden lesson plan, right? Oh, I'll share it with anybody, but you can't mess with it. Office 2013 now allows you to open up a PDF. Uh, and you can do that one of two ways. You can either do file open and you actually pick the PDF. So I'm on the right hand side now and moving it here. I'm going to browse my machine and go to the desktop. There's my PDF. Before you didn't see PDFs with Word, I click open. It's going to say, hey, do you really want to do this? I click OK, and then check this out. It so the whole thing, even the text, is an image? So uh, Sometimes that's where you're getting the PDF from, too, as well. So it doesn't always work. Just know that. But if it's text-based content, it could be bringing it as a picture, too, because the PDF might actually be a picture. It might actually be an image and not text that was converted. So here I am. I can actually go anywhere and start modifying this content now, as you can see. I'm modifying. I'm deleting. I'm moving stuff around. And that, again, was a PDF. All right? Go ahead. All right, so my chance now, what if you have a Word document? You got some text on it, but a, a student might be challenged with being able to read all the text on the document, and they would benefit from being it heard, spoken to them. So there's a tool inside of Microsoft Word, well, all the Office tools, called Speak, uh, albeit it's typically not on in place. So I'm just going to go up to the little uh, quick access toolbar way in the top upper left, uh, and I'm going to elect to customize that and add a tool. Of course, you can add tools to any toolbar, but I'm going to come on all the way down to the bottom where it says More Commands, because I want to go out and find that Speak command. We'll click. And the speak command happens to be listed under all commands here in the Word options. And by the way, you can do this in Excel and PowerPoint and OneNote as well, so just so you know. Uh, and then I'm going to come all the way down into the letter S's. It takes me a little while to get there. And I'll find the one that's called speak. It's alphabetical. And it has this little thought bubble next to it. And all I have to do is add it to the toolbar. It moves over to the right. And I'll click OK. Now, if everything worked well, and it sort of did, because I can see up here in the upper left that I've added the speak icon uh, to that toolbar. So now I'll select some text in my document, and I'll click on the little speak button. And theoretically, my machine will read it to me. Albeit, there's a red X on it. So I don't know why. Hmm. So that's what you call a fail. We'll move on. So think about how that can impact your classroom in terms of reading games and, and just being able to actually there. read aloud. Uh, and that is native in all of the Office applications. What you doing? Yeah, I believe it's actually also by application. There is a script if you go work on with IT that they can actually push it through into every application. That's what we're doing in our district. All right, and also another type of app that you can put in in Word, and this is new in 2013. When I click on Insert, I actually have an area there for apps. And when I click on Apps, I can go to My Apps that I might have previously downloaded, but this isn't my machine, so I'm going to go out to the store. And I can look at these apps to put in with my Word document to help enhance. Some you have to pay for, some are free. And there is one on here that's not there right now. Here it is, Word Cloud, Pro Word Cloud. How many of you use Taxedo, Word Cloud, those kinds of things to make them? You can make them straight in Word right now. So I'm going to choose Word Cloud. One thing about the apps, and if you were in our mix session, you saw when you're putting in one of these apps, you have to click Trust It, because it's one, wanting to let you know what it's going to be accessing, so we're clicking Trust It. And it's going to open up a side panel on the right-hand side. So I'm in Word, go to Apps, and I was using the Word Cloud. And then we get to sit here and smile at each other while it's loading. Perhaps if there was music in the background playing, it'll come. I'm going to go ahead and select the text. I was teasing about music. Okay. It's loading. Bradley, your machine is going to, it's, it's, oh, there we go. Now, when it finally comes up, 
I'm able to choose what type of font, what color choices, everything I need. You notice I've selected the text. There we go. And I can even choose some other options. When I click Create Word Cloud, it's going to take just a moment to generate that word cloud. And it'll go, it will be right here. Yes, it will. There we go. So I highlighted the text and I've made the word cloud in Word. Now it doesn't live in Word yet, it's just letting me use it. So a couple of things I could do, I could do that snipping tool and take a picture of it to use in another application. But if I just right click on it, I can copy it. And then I can come to my Word document and paste it and the Jeopardy theme playing in the background. And it's going to grab that picture my, of my word cloud and it's going to paste it right here in my document where I did, chose to do it. And that was all built into Word. I went to insert apps, selected the app that I wanted to use, generated it, copy paste and it's in. So we're going to let it marinate while it's going. I'm going to head to Excel and I'm going to show you some tricks with Excel. We have one of our colleagues with us and we actually, I grabbed, yeah, I grabbed her file when we were asked to do this flash fill. Now how many of you download, and by the way, Stephanie, Stephanie. Ray, this is Stephanie's document that we used on our training team. It's an excellent example of how to do it. Isn't that where it came from? Yeah. Okay, Josh looked at me. Um, so a great opportunity to use flash fill. When you download things from a different system, sometimes it's not in the right order or it doesn't look, the data doesn't look the way you want it to look. So you've, oh, the music is playing. So you have to flip the data. Sometimes there's an Excel formula that you can use to flip it. Well, watch what Flash Fill will do now. I've downloaded this and it's Nelson Judy, but I really want a more friendly look. So I'm going to type in Judy Nelson. Some of our secretaries in our department spend hours doing this. We've showed them the formula, but they still have to apply the formula. I've done it once. When I go to the second person, I'm going to type in Thomas. Watch what happened. I just started typing Thomas. Excel is smart enough to realize, oh, well, this is what you did on the first name. Perhaps you want to do it on the second, and it transposes the data. It will do the same type of thing for phone numbers. If you want to put in the area code, if it's not formatted correctly, you'll do the flash fill. You start typing it, and it'll fix it for you. You can notice it gives me a preview of what the data is going to look like. When I press enter, it continues to fill it in all correctly. <laughs> It's built in. It's built in. 2013. You can, Maria, you can add content like the domain name to for the email. Go. No, go for it. You do it. It's good enough. So just in addition to that, while, uh, while Maria switches gears, you, you can see that the original example here says email. So you can actually add additional content and it will pick up on that as you flash fill. So you can put your domain name behind these names to, to autofill the email. Because a lot of folks want to send up, they have a list of names, but they need to send them to a bunch of emails. So here's a quick way of doing that. So when I... And then I start typing Thomas it finished filling in the email addresses. So that's what, it'll not only transpose it, then when I put it in, Here, uh, it's there. Oh. Hey, Josh got a wow, awesome. Oh. Now, there's also quick analysis that I can do, and I'm just looking for something real quick. I'm gonna highlight just some data on this spreadsheet. And Stephanie, thank you again. When I highlight the data, you'll notice the smart tag that comes up. Up until this point, they've been the bane of my existence, these smart tags saying, I know how to do it better, or I can help you. But now when I click on it, it's going to give me access to all of these tools that I use for data. Perhaps I want to do some conditional formatting. Maybe I want to display a chart for this. Very quickly, I just clicked on the smart tag, and I have all of these at my fingertips. I can insert a subtotal roll, row if I want to make it into a table if it wasn't already, or throw in spark lines, these trends in the cells if you needed to. Very quickly, all built in. And all I did is select the data that was already on the spreadsheet, and it was this little tag in the bottom right-hand corner to bring it up. So that's quick analysis. In addition to that, and then Brad, you're up. Um, in addition to that, notice when she highlights the, the numbers or the content at the bottom of Excel, it's automatically now giving you a count average in the sum. So you don't have to insert the formulas to do that. You just grab what you want to total, and it's sitting right in front of you. Okay. Actually, Josh, right, right click. Maria, right click down there on the green bar. And you can choose additional. Nice. Yeah. 
Nice. And we share that with our business people, some of our secretaries, when you're having to keep track of a budget and you need to know, because we spend to the penny, so knowing how close I'm getting, instead of having a formula con constantly keeping it up and have to sit a cell for, or keep a cell for that, all I have to do is just highlight and I can kind of keep a total of what's going on in those quick sums. Now I'm going to switch gears and actually switch machines to Josh's machine to PowerPoint. Is that correct? Yeah. And we're going to flip machines as if doing a variety of apps wasn't enough fun we're doing a variety of different machines wireless and with all of the fun installed i don't uh, you think you i'm talking about it all right yay they untethered me from the mic mm -hmm. so i'm in powerpoint and let me just take it out real quick everybody knows how to bring in a video in powerpoint really easy i just click insert go to media i'm going to bring in a video this video happens to be sitting on josh's desktop creative commons if you haven't checked out creative commons do it it's an awesome website finding copyright free material i brought in my video i can resize it play it nothing new but if you haven't seen this yet when, once i bring in the video i've gained two, i've gained two extra tabs here i have a format tab and on the format tab in the video styles, there's an option up here for shapes. You can actually crop that video into a shape. So maybe I want to play it in a heart. I love Creative Commons, so I'm gonna play it in a heart. And now, when I play the video, it's going to play in the shape of a heart because I've cropped it, and I can resize it and do that kind of thing. I can also, I don't have to crop it into that shape, but I can, on the Format tab, also on video styles, even just put a frame around it. Maybe I want it to look 3D or look like it's in a picture frame. And there you go. And now when I play the video, it's gonna play in that shape. I did nothing special. I just clicked the video and clicked the format tab. And in video styles is where I have those options to do that at. Now you can also edit your video. The last few versions of PowerPoint have let you do this, but prior to that, I would have to take my video, put it in a third party, crop it, trim it, do whatever I need to do. Well, now it's built right into PowerPoint. When I choose the video and I go back to playback, right here it says trim video. I can click trim video. It's going to open up in another window. And do you see the green scrubber bar and the red scrubber bar? So maybe, I don't know about you, but in my class, whenever I video students, it was always we would get the camera, go, and then it would go, no, it's your turn your turn and they would bunch each other and so I would have this at the beginning well now I can just grab that scrubber bar move it in the 10 seconds and I even get a preview of what's going on on the screen and I only need a 15 second clip rather than a two or three minute video so I can grab the grab the end scrubber bar and when I click OK and do something else to Josh's machine he loves when I work on his machine I now have this video that is trimmed in ready to go Oh, you're on extended now. All right. All right. So, video, you can bring in those two styles and you're ready to go. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so quick, sorry, quick question. If I do that in 2013 and then I get to the computer and you want to skip around? I'm still standing in front of it. Just trying to load up PowerPoint. It's just to create it in the video. I can do PowerPoint on yours. It wants to say it's a PowerPoint, it's going to play, crop, shape, the trim, whatever you do. The other thing, sorry guys, about the trend. Here's what we'll do. Um, just the blank one is fine. Yep, we have, we have 11 minutes. So let's give it a skip some stuff. That comes in handy in my classroom because maybe I only need the first two minutes of this video for my introduction to the unit. But tomorrow, when I dive in a little bit deeper, I want the introduction in a little bit more. I just take the scrubber bar and I extend it. It doesn't. It's trimming it for what's displayed, but it's not trimming it for what's embedded in that PowerPoint presentation. So that was inserting the video and changing the styles. And evidently, I have messed up Josh's machine. Because when I go to edit, I can see that video has been trimmed. And I can change the style. And that's all I need to do. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the next question I have is about the video. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have our 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 video. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have we have Office Mix in this session, just to show you a little bit, and we will if we have time, but if you haven't been to Office Mix session, or you haven't seen it, go to mix.office.com and check it out, because you can even have a video recording of yourself 
presented the material. It's an awesome, awesome tool. Have a lot of go check that out. We skip in these. You just want to use mine. Just use Curious George real quick. Do that and broadcast. You need the mic, right? Oh, I need to stay here then? Okay. Yeah. All right, so we flip. Oh. It's on extended again. No. Well, let's just get out of that. Let's see how that goes. Why is there a movie on that? I added the movie. You weren't paying attention to me. All right, so I don't want a movie on there. So uh, what if, what if you have a image or a slide in your PowerPoint that, as an example, this yellow picture sitting on top of a blue frame doesn't look particularly good, and you'd like to have the yellow gone. And so, well, PowerPoint 2013 does that now. So you just double click on the image. Uh, and the contextual format tab comes up. And on the top left corner of the contextual format tab, it says remove background. So all I have to do is click to remove background. Uh, and now I've got the image with these little borders around it, these little bubbles. And, the, and if, frankly, I think it did a pretty good job, except for on the left, I need to scoot that bubble out just a little bit so it doesn't cut off the bunny. Uh, and then when I'm done, I'll just say keep changes. And now all of a sudden, the image is free of its background. And it looks a whole lot nicer than it did before, right? No. Not really, no. no. You can get more particular if it's, if it's more difficult. You can select and remove and select and remove and select and remove. You can ultimately do a really good job. I didn't, I didn't try too hard, but it worked out okay, right? So now, of course, you can copy that image in its current format and then take it elsewhere, too. It just doesn't have to live on one slide. So what you used to have to do in Adobe Photoshop for a reasonably expensive price, you can now do in Office 2013 PowerPoint. Uh, the next thing is, what if you'd like to share a PowerPoint with an audience, but your audience might not necessarily all be physically with you? And uh, that's something that's called broadcast. And so for that, I'm going to go down to File, and I'm going to go down to Share. Uh, and in Share, I'm going to choose Present Online. And, well, is that the one I wanted? Just present Online and then yeah. Microsoft Link, change it. And then I want to change that drop down. Good deal. So this says, I'm going to need a Microsoft account, and that's okay, and I'll do it when I'm ready. And all I have to do is click Present Online, and it'll give me an opportunity to sign in. After I sign in, it'll generate a URL, and that URL that I will post anywhere on the web for people to see or send emails to people. Uh, and all I have to do is click on that email and participate in the PowerPoint. I'm not going to waste time signing in right now. But that's the process of broadcasting a PowerPoint. You send that URL out, and anybody who gets the URL will have an opportunity to watch the PowerPoint live as you go through it. So it's not a delay, it's live, right, when you go through it. Sending my mic hot. All right, so I'm, I've got the attempt. I'll just bring this home in the next six minutes, just kind of bouncing all over the place. And Brad, if you want to maybe queue one thing up, if we can get to it. Okay. Um, so we've got a session tomorrow. I believe it's at 10 a.m. if you want to hop over to that uh, for OneNote. But I'm going to show you kind of the, the power of OneNote of a couple of things. First and foremost, if you've got a powerful device like the Microsoft Surface, it's pretty simple as, if I can spell, just annotate, annotating, right? And so what if I have existing content and I'm just going to join here and I want to talk to my students about something and tell them this is the link they need to go to inside of OneNote. Basically, that's how quick it goes. All right? I just grabbed the pen. If you don't have a pen, if you have a device that doesn't inherently have one, there is a draw tab here and you can actually just use your finger on a touch device or a mouse if you don't have a touch device. Uh, in addition to that, Maria kind of showed the snipping tool earlier, but there's a default application here um, built into OneNote and let me pull this up here first, uh, and it's called uh, screen clipping. And so basically, how many times have you gone through uh, this problem right here where you just need somebody to give you a screen clipping, and oh, by the way, in OneNote, it grabs a screen clip and dumps it right onto your OneNote page, and by the way, it gives you the source of where it came from, the date and the time as well. All right, so again, that was insert screen clipping. I set up whatever I want behind OneNote, I grab it, and it dumps it into my OneNote. I could additionally use down at the bottom, there are quick launch bars, screen clipping there, I could
press that anywhere I want. I could copy and paste now, and I can copy it to my clipboard or send it anywhere into OneNote. And then if I wanted to paste that, I would also get that as well. And then now see the power of what I could do with annotation. I could do anything I needed to. All right, so that's kind of screen clipping. Uh, the other thing, we don't have time to do this, but a really cool, powerful tool within, and I don't know if it'll do it here, is you get an option that you can actually make text image searchable. And then you also copy text from picture. This is really cool. And then paste. So there's all the text out of this picture. OneNote has OCR recognition, which basically it's skimming through the picture for any text, and it will give you that information. So if anybody ever sends you some slides that might just be images, you can grab the text off of them using this tool. Uh, one more addition into OneNote, if you're not going to make it to the session, is OneNote has insert recording audio and video. So I simply just say record audio, and what it starts doing is now my mic's hot on my device, and as I'm speaking and working around, it's recording. Anytime I take any sort of notes, what it's doing is it's actually doing playback while I'm speaking, and it's capturing what I'm doing. Okay, and it's going to jump around on playback. So if I were to say, hey, here's what I just took notes on while my uh, instructor or my students were presenting, and when I play this back, what it's going to do. And working around, it's recording. Look at the screen. Anytime I take any sort of notes, what it's doing is it's actually doing What's playback while I'm speaking and it's capturing what I'm doing. Okay. Okay, so basically what's happening there is it sees the playback as the audio is happening, it's aligning what you've done on the OneNote page. Pretty neat. You also get a play bar right next to it. As you can see next to the one, two, three, four, there's a little tiny play button. You could do that same thing with video. And oh, by the way, when you click insert video, a little window pops up with whatever camera you've enabled, and you can actually embed the video right there on the page. The best piece about it is it gives you an audio file, and it gives you a video file that you can take out to any application that you work with MP3s and or WMVs or any sorts of files like that. So pretty neat stuff there. I'm just going to. You've got the flyer, Microsoft Educator Network. It has some online training there as well. We've got two minutes, so. You will. Just pick two of them. Right. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Chat will ask us good. So I'm going to kind of pick two of the next ones that you're probably going to want to walk with. How many of you guys are Windows 8 users? All right, so this is the native install travel app, okay, and this is pretty neat. Think about using this in education. You wouldn't think of using a travel app for this, but um, shout out to City. Any city, major city. Singapore. She says Singapore. Stephanie's the winner there. I'm going to go, oh, which one do I want? Singapore, Singapore. First thing I learned right there was I didn't know Singapore was in Singapore, right? But check this out. Immediately, I have access to thousands of resources and content that maybe I didn't know about. It gets even better, though. As I scroll to the right, here's some photos, but there's panoramas, and this is really cool. Watch this. Look what I'm doing here. So this is travel app. And if you don't have a device like this, you can use a mouse. This is all powered by Bing Images. And if you even use uh, Bing for desktop, you'll get to access to some of these. So again, this is not every city in the world, but there's a lot of great content here. <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. All right, another one of my favorites here, if you haven't checked this out, and definitely go down to the Microsoft booth. We talk about amazing content in this guy uh, that we partnered up with in our district from eCorinth. Uh, basically, that's what their whole job is, is they build out some really amazing, powerful content for Windows 8 applications. And let's talk about why it's important in this video game or gaming design era to really bring some really cool content down to the students. Imagine if I was teaching whatever the heck that says up there, right? And I needed to actually have a 3D or a physical diagram. What if I needed to zoom in to get down to the cellular structure? Or what if I wanted to go through a germ cell? <laughs> I'm going to skip around here, OK? This is just one of many that they have to offer. One of my favorites is actually the micro engines. And they also have augmented reality so that I can actually hold the code up in front of the camera and manipulate the object in my hand. And that's Corinth, C-O-R-I-N-T-H. The best piece about this is they're right now engineering R&D so that these applications print to 3D printers. 
So you can go right into this native application for geology. We can go, okay, what do I want to look at? Oh, we're looking at a soil sample, or we're looking at this specific rock here. And then all of a sudden, not only am I manipulating and zooming down on this rock, I can send it to a 3D printer, and the student can hold that in whatever media that they printed it out on. So that's pretty powerful. Four minutes. Go for it. Switch. All right, so, so let's talk okay. math. Some of, uh, some of us might be really good math science teachers. We're looking for a really great tool where students can do math on their machine, uh, and it happens much more quickly. So you can accomplish a whole lot more in a really short period of time, and it gives you the power of visualization as you build in. So here's a tool called Fluid Math. I handed the handout out to you originally. These folks are partners of Microsoft, and they're down in the Microsoft booth. You can go down and see more of what you see here you like. So let's say we're doing some of our uh, favorite math, except that I can't write very well. So you might recognize that as a point and slope formula for a linear line. And so our students, are we need to teach that process to them. So what we would do is we'd ask the kids to generate a graph, and we would look at the graph based on the numbers that they generate. That takes a long time to do. You, you substitute numbers, you plot points, you draw a line. I can get right to it, just as an example. I can say, what, what is the value of the graph when x equals 2? Well, you see, that's not enough information because there's more than one variable. So I need one more. So what is the value when, oops, when b equals 5? So now I think I've got enough information to find out what the graph looks like. Watch that. That's what the graph looks like right there. So it graphs the line for you. You can, you can uh, stretch and manipulate the line. You can move around the line. You can zoom in and out on the graph. So within a matter of instant, you can see what the graph looks like. But it doesn't end there. Originally, that's what the graph looks like for x equals 2. I'm going to get rid of, oops. Uh, I'm going to get rid of x equal 2. And I'm going to say x equal 5. Uh, and I'm going to get rid of b equal 5. And you'll notice the graph is changing, b equals 2. So while I change the values in the function, the graph responds directly to it. And that's just simple linear one dimension. It goes all the way up into linear multi-dimension. Uh, and it, in fact, goes into things uh, that you use in physics class as well. So uh, I'll go again. fluid math. Fluid math. There's a handout. Free app for Windows 8, installation on Windows 7. They are a partner down in the Microsoft uh, booth during this event. So if you're a math person, stop in and see them. I know we stop at 4. We're willing to keep going if you want to stay. We'll, we'll go, how about until 4.15, okay, if that's okay with everybody in the room. It's not going to hurt our feelings if you have to get up. Uh, we're going to swap to this device here. All right, we'll go to 4.15. And uh, the next one I'm basically going to show off, we actually just had a really cool session on Singapore, and uh, you guys saw me doing some really cool uh, 3D content there with Corinth. But what if I wanted to disseminate this information quickly and efficiently down to my students? I've given you some examples there, but check this out. The Power Window 8, share. I've installed an app called Share to QR Code. You scan that and you're right there with me now. That's how fast it is. I didn't have to do anything but click Share to QR. So that's really powerful and what I like about that. There's another session? Okay. No, this is with any, uh, it works on specific applications and or desktop applications where you actually can share. Yes, yeah, so share is native as part of Windows 8. You can see that Windows 8 would be mail, OneNote, and uh, the reading list. Share to QR is in the Windows 8 store. And then only certain apps work with it. So you can't share everything. So I couldn't share that current that I did earlier because it's a, kind of a native install. But anything typically powered by Bing you can share with. Uh, the other thing that's nice here is I can throw it straight out to Twitter or on a reading list for students to read, etc. So it's a, that's a pretty cool little app there. You want to pull one more out, Brad? Yeah, I think that He's next. Yep. Okay, at 420? Yep. Okay, so I, I think we got to... So, yeah. Do one more and then we'll be done. So, let's, let's put it to mind and go mind. And one last thing. So, all, along the line of theme, uh, science and math, uh, I just opened up a tool called Worldwide Telescope. It's also a free tool for Microsoft. Uh, it's in, it includes... All the images from almost all of the space missions and and or uh, telescopes around the world, and I just so happened to have pulled up the representation of the night sky with the planetary system inside of it. 
and it's a little bit busy right now. I can clean up some of my menus, but the point is, and if you're looking for a way to bring the night sky into your classroom to teach your students about the science through astronomy, then imagine using the worldwide telescope to bring that planetarium directly into your classroom. And for that matter, you can point to the projector to the ceiling and, and complete the, uh, the conversion and make your room into the planetarium. So once in there, you notice you can zoom and roll and take a trip right through the galaxy. I can go from one planet to the next. I can focus on the uh, uh, constellations in the background. Uh, and as a matter of fact, along the top, you'll notice that there's a number of different tours already in place. And so if I click on solar system tour, uh, and if I want to go visit Mercury, I can load up the solar system tour of Mercury, and it'll take me right to Mercury and give me a close-up view. Uh, of what that planet is like based on the tour that's been pre-populated. Right. And of course, you can create your own tour. So Worldwide Telescope, great opportunity to bring astronomy into your classroom. All right, we'd love to share a heck of a lot more with you. We, out of courtesy of the next presenter, we got to get out of here. Do me a favor, please stop by the Microsoft booth. There's folks like us that are there for all day tomorrow that we can work with you one-on-one, -on -one showing you more of what we have. Uh, we have a lineup of sessions you're going to want to see tomorrow. Brad's got another one tomorrow called 30 and 40, 30 free and 40. It's kind of rapid fire, uh, but definitely feel free. Look through those brochures and those handouts that we've given you. But again, thank you, and check out that back channel for more information. Thanks, guys.